morning uh, to our viewers. My name is Kunal Sarkar. I'm an interventional cardiologist at the DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center of the Methodist uh, Hospital in Houston. Uh, today we are very gla uh, glad and honored to have uh, Professor Giampaolo Usia from University of Rome, Italy. Uh, we just had an excellent and very educated presentation on transcatheter mitral interventions. And now we'll take the opportunity to welcome him and sort of pick his brains a little more about this evolving subject. Uh, Dr. Russia, once again, uh, thank you very much for making the trip. Thank you very much for visiting us and actually with that beautiful and most educative talk. It uh, caused a lot of stimulating questions and I think we can continue this discussion into this small interview, but at a different pace and to ask you some things that probably were not covered in that uh, interview in that uh, grand rounds. Mm. Uh, I would like to start off uh, by, uh, by requesting you to give a summary of where the field of mitral intervention stands today. We have transcatheter mitral valve replacement, we have repair technologies. So where are we today in May 2017? Thank you. First of all, I want to thank you for organizing this uh, visit, this meeting at this very nice hospital. And, and uh, yes, the meeting was really stimulating and uh, I really enjoyed and it was really an honor and privilege to, to be here. Now, uh, for the, mm, your question, <coughs> we are uh, at one point that the transcatheter mitral valve um, therapy um, can be divided in repair and replacement. Now, repair was introduced almost 10 years ago now uh, with the, um, the mitral clip, um, and we are having quite good result in terms of uh, procedural success and um, safety in this patient, um, <coughs> both in the primary and secondary mitral regurgitation. Um, the problem uh, is that Sometimes uh, some regurgitation is left, and this regurgitation left can impact the prognosis, especially in the secondary one, the mitral valve uh, regurgitation. Transcatheter uh, mitral uh, valve replacement is a very beginning. Um, there are some uh, devices who are under investigation <coughs> use, and um, the problem is that uh, because the mitral valve anatomy and function is not as simple as the aortic valve, um, there are some issues that have to be solved um, from both procedural point of view and technical point of view. <coughs> technical point of view is that the mitral valve is very large, so we need a large valve, and uh, delivering a large valve uh, from, example, totally, totally trans, uh, percutaneous with transeptal access um, Pawn some difficulty in uh, the navigation of the device. Transapical is uh, uh, good access, is very direct, is uh, um, quite easy, but in patients with functional mitral regurgitation who often have um, mitral uh, left ventricular dysfunction, the transapical access can be less tolerated and uh, in the scar can be less tolerated, so we can have some worsening of the left ventricular function after uh, the procedure. So f finally, I think for now, uh, the transcatheter repair has more uh, clinical application. We are having a lot of data. We are waiting also for some, some data. With the COP trial uh, running in the US uh, will, be, will give soon as some more insights. Um, there are also other devices are uh, going to be used. For the transcatheter mitral valve replacement, we still need a few years for developing a better device and which can solve all the um, technical and anatomical issues of the mitral valve. So carrying on from there, uh, both transcatheter mitral repair and transcatheter mitral valve replacement are developing or are evolving at their own pace. Uh, there is a learning curve associated with uh, these procedures. Uh, do you think the evolution of transcatheter mitral intervention, specifically more in 
uh, in regard to replacement would follow a trajectory similar to TAVR, uh, where we had transapical and transfemoral or non-transapical approaches. And uh, then finally we realized that transapical was probably uh, not associated with great outcomes even when we uh, standardized for uh, baseline comorbidities. Or we are going to have a transapical uh, approach first for mitral valve and then uh, you know go through the same or even more steeper learning curve in terms of uh, uh, when and how and which patients to do this procedure on. Cool. Um, trans um, Tabor is a really different approach respect to the uh, transcatal mitral valve repair or replacement. The ortival stenosis is, uh, is there, the access is more straight and in the Independently, uh, if uh, we are using balloon or self-expandable valve, the technique is um, more reproducible, uh, is more standardized, and the learning curve is much shorter than to transcatal mitral valve repair. Also, even in, with matic clip, um, the learning curve is a bit, little bit longer because um, we uh, the operator need to interact with the echocardiographer for understanding also the imaging following not only with fluoroscopy but also with echo what he is doing and all the maneuver are different and we need to manipulate a lot the device in order to have, have a good orientation a good perpendicularity to the mitral valve and we can extend this also to the transcranial mitral valve replacement is even more difficult because um, with a totally transeptal transfemoral approach um, we need to uh, to follow all the well, every steps in the correct way, we, we have to be precise. From the transeptal puncture to the crossing of the metal valve, creating whenever is necessary a loop, we need to follow every steps, and every steps has some technical uh, demanding, so need some skills. <coughs> so I think that for transcatal metal, metal valve replacement, the learning curve would be longer. And uh, the goal of everybody is to make the procedure um, standardized and reproducible. But um, for this, we need to improve the, um, the device and the technique of the delivery of the device. So uh, <coughs> the current uh, experience with dedicated TMVR devices is what, 200 cases worldwide, maybe a little more. And the outcomes have not been very encouraging. It's uh, multifactorial, I'm sure. Uh, they are very sick patients, and uh, these are bulky devices. Uh, you have the unique experience of having successful outcome in transeptal TMVR. You, know, you showed us, you shared with us today, 26 months follow-up with those two patients, excellent uh, hemodynamics. Uh, and I was really, really intrigued that the LV ejection fraction was preserved and frankly it looked better, it improved. Uh, and these were the transeptal patients. Uh, again, so why is it that transeptal is not uh, a preferred strategy for uh, TMVR? <laughs> this is because transeptal still needs, um, is not easy, is not simple, is very complicated and we have to plan in advance the, um, the procedure and also maybe the skills required to the operators at, at least in this phase now uh, is very high and so um, uh, the, pr the procedure is not, uh, and the, the, the results are not so predictable. Even if we had two patients, consecutive patients with very good results uh, with 100% success, but <coughs> uh, till now all the um, Mm, companies are trying to have to prove that the valve is working well, so they preferring the transapical uh, access, which is easier. And, and but the, the results not very good is because again the metal valve is very complicated. We have uh, several problems, several issues. We don't have a real annulus. The stress of the metal valve is different from the stress of the uh, aortic valve because it's larger because the gradient between the ventricle and the atrium is higher, so the hydrostatic pressure is much higher. And the metal uh, leaflets are larger than the aortic leaflets. 
and also we have also to face with the thrombosis problem. We have thrombosis when we don't have a good push out, when we have a stagnation of the blood. And we are observing this in the uh, aortic uh, valve scenario, um, but this is also true for a patient with a uh, mitral valve uh, replacement. Because especially if they have atrial fibrillation, the blood uh, can stagnate, it can form clots both in the atrium side and also sometimes on the lipid on the ventricular side. And also we have to, to understand and we have to avoid any LVT obstruction. We have to remember that the anterior lift of the metal valve is in continuity with the aortic valve. There is a very strict correlation, topographic correlation. So when we plan to implant the valve, we need to understand if we are going to have some problem with LVT obstruction. Sometimes we can avoid because planning in advance, but we, are, we have uh, some uh, percentage of uh, uncertainty, uncertainty because when we place a valve, even if from the transapical, it is enough that we change a few degrees of the, the puncture, the access, so the transapical access, and then we maybe we can uh, place the valve too close to the edge. So, so it seems it's like a more of a, uh, there is a component of technical approach and actually the placement mm -hmm. of the device, whether it is supraannular or it's deep into the LV, which can help us mitigate LVOT obstruction. So this is an engineering exactly. uh, engineering issue that you make a device which probably avoids it or select the patient uh, based on the device and select the device based on the patient. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, I mean, I think this is a question that uh, will interest many. You have been credited with many first-in-man uh, procedures in the realm of structural intervention. Uh, the first mitra clip in Italy, that was the second in Europe, the first core valve, a lot of uh, very uh, insightful and educative work came out of, uh, uh, you know, the valve in valve approach for implant failure uh, in terms of TAVR. Uh, I would like, and I have asked this question to other people, experienced operators, and all of them say you should be consistent and they have their own uh, formula for staying consistent. But the interesting thing is when you are going to do something first time, you cannot really have consistency. So my question to you would be, how do you plan a first-in-man procedure? <laughs> this is a very good question. So first of all, you have to trust the procedure. You have, to, you have to trust, you have to be sure that we are going to do something useful that can be durable. Um, and also you have to plan in advance all the kind of complications you can face and then try to prevent or to be ready to solve it. So when you are doing for the first time a procedure, you have some risk. But if it's a calculated risk, you can afford it because you know what to do and you know um, how to behave in case of complication, in case of problems. Second time is discuss with the patient. Be honest with the patient, tell him what you are going to do to him that maybe he, is the, he will be the first to do this procedure. And it's very important to have the, the patient who collaborate, who trust you. And third, trust on your team. Because you know, all these procedures are also team-based. So uh, I need to have my cardiac anesthesiologist because I know how he behaves in all kinds of situations from the uh, smooth procedure to the complicated procedure. I need my echocardiogram because I need that she knows uh, exactly what I need without speaking. You know, so I, and uh, I need this coordination. And I need also the, um, the nurse, everything, everybody who, who works with us and uh, is, um, I, can I have to rely on them. Uh, these are the three main components. So uh, individually, is this instinct driving your prior knowledge or is it prior knowledge that drives the instinct for the procedure? <coughs> I think I would say is an instinct. Begins. It has to be instinctive. And so, sometimes when you face a problem, some complication, can solve, but there is not, you know, after, after I solve that I can standardize, I can um, understand all the steps I've done and how I manage it. Well, 
Dr. Rusia, thank you very much for sharing your uh, experience and for this insightful interview. It thank was you. a pleasure having you. Thank you, Dr. Saka.